There's a lot of inertia in dividend policy. If you ask a company, why do you pay this out? Because that's what we've always paid out. In fact, here's my backing for that. Every year I keep track in the US of how many companies increase dividends, how many companies cut dividends, and how many companies do nothing to dividends every year. So I take all US companies that have dividends, look at how many companies increase dividends, that's the orange, how many companies cut dividends, I'm sorry, that's the red, how many companies cut dividends, that's the orange, and how many companies do nothing to dividends. This is 1989 through 1998, but you can probably stretch this out from 1950 to 2007 and you get the same results. In every single year, the number of companies that do nothing to dividends outnumbers the companies that either increase dividends or decrease dividends. And among the companies that change dividends, companies increase dividends far more often than they cut dividends. So if you ask me to, to summarize what most companies do in dividends in the US, most companies pay out what they did last year. Among the companies that change dividends, companies are more likely to increase dividends and decrease dividends even in recession years. Because in recession years, what's the story here? Oh, companies are going to cut dividends. Even if they cut dividends, even in recession years, more companies increase dividends and decrease dividends. So key word to describe dividends is they're sticky. Second word I would use to describe dividends is they tend to follow earnings. Key word here is follow. They don't lead earnings. They're not contemporaneous with earnings. They follow earnings. Let me explain what this means. You have a company that reports a 30% growth in earnings this year. That's a pretty good year, right? If you ask me what will this company do to its dividends this year, my guess is nothing. They'll just sit and watch. You have two good years of earnings in a row. Maybe they will increase dividends next year. Three good years in a row, perhaps they will increase dividends in the third year. Companies hold back on changing dividends till they feel convinced that they can increase dividends. So you'll actually see companies, earnings go up three, four, five years in a row, nothing happens to dividends, and in the fifth year, finally, you'll see an increase in dividends. And in fact, when you, when you compare the earnings graph with the dividend graph, the purple line is the earnings number, look at how much smoother the total dividends paid at US companies is than the total earnings. So earnings go up and down, dividends are a much smoother line. So dividends are sticky, dividends tend to follow earnings. Until about 25 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago, when you talked about dividend policy, all you had to think about was dividends paid by companies. You see, what else is there? What's the other way you can return cash? Stock buybacks, right? 20 years ago, stock buybacks were the exception. Very few companies bought back stock. I'm going to show you a graph that's going to show you how stock buybacks have taken over dividend policy. See this, graph, this purple line? That's the aggregate dividend, the total dividend paid by all US companies every year. So as an example, in 1988, US companies collectively paid a dividend of $100 billion. In 1988, US companies collectively bought back $50 billion worth of stock. Take a look at those two lines and track them through time. As you go, 88, 89, 90, in the 90s especially, Look at the stock buyback line. In fact, in 1998, for the very first time in US corporate history, almost as much money got returned in the form of stock buybacks as was paid out in dividends. And every year since, far more money has been returned in stock buybacks collectively than has been paid out in dividends. Last year, for instance, twice as much money was returned in the form of stock buybacks than was paid out as dividends. Clearly, there's something going on here, right? So here's my question to close the day. Why is this happening? Why are US companies, and this is a trend you're starting to see even in Europe and Latin America and Asia, why are companies increasingly shifting from dividends to stock buybacks? Anybody want to try? Yes. Okay. When who's you that's getting control? Companies, but the company is this legal entity. Who in the company is getting control? Okay. So the first reaction might be if I'm an insider, but it's got to be an insider. If you don't own stock, it doesn't matter if you buy back stock, you still own only 0%. But if you own 7% of stock and you buy back stock, you're going to end up owning 10% of stock, right? There are fewer shares outstanding. But here's something to think about. Isn't that always been true? I mean, in fact, what I'm, what I'm leading you towards is a story you tell me has to be specific to the 1990s. It can't be increasing control because that's always been true. 
I mean, people didn't wake up and they say, oh my God, control is worth more. It can't be a tax story because taxes have always penalized dividends. In fact, taxes penalized dividends a lot more in the 60s. You know what the highest marginal tax rate in the 60s was? In 1961, the highest marginal tax rate in the US was 90%. Nine zero. You got a dollar in dividends, you paid 90 cents in taxes. You got a dollar in capital gains, you paid 36 cents in taxes. In 1986, the tax rate in dividends was 28%, the tax rate in capital gains was 28%. If there was a tax disadvantage, companies should have been buying back stock in the 60s and the 70s, not the 80s and 90s. I don't see how that gets rid of the transparency issue, right? Control here just basically means you own a bigger percentage. It doesn't take care of the transparency problem. Right? Yes. Go ahead. You're just returning cash one way or the other. So instead of getting the three dollars in dividends, I think I can see the check that I get in dividends a lot better than I can see an increase in the stock price. Right? It's actually there. I can deposit in the bank. No, the value of the company doesn't increase. The value of the equity just stays the same. You just have more value of equity per share. You have fewer shares outstanding. Yes? I'm sorry? See, that's a very recent phenomenon, right? Last two years. And in fact, if you're worried about private equity buying you out, you get exactly the same effect by paying dividends as buying back stock. I'll give you a clue. Management options. Jawad, try it out. Well, if you give managers options, how do options work again? If the stock price goes above your strike price, you make money, right? Every time you pay a dividend, what happens to your stock price? It drops by the amount of the dividend. If instead of paying dividends, you buy back stock, you push up the stock price. So one story that drives this is the more you reward managers with options, the more you're going to push them away from conventional dividends to buybacks. There's another factor as well. What did, how do I describe dividends? They're sticky, right? Once you start paying them, you're stuck paying them. If you're uncertain about earnings, you don't want to increase dividends. I'm going to argue that in the 80s and the 90s, companies got increasingly uncertain about their earnings because of global competition. There were fewer and fewer companies with safe markets. Dividends are very dangerous if you're uncertain about whether you can sustain earnings. Stock buybacks are much more transitory. In fact, I'll close off today with what I think is the best way of explaining dividends versus stock buybacks. It came to me when I was driving my daughter to a birthday party about five years ago. She's now 12 and she was about seven, maybe eight. So as soon as, as, soon as she gets in the car, she says, Dad, I want to listen to Z100, a station I just hate. <laughs> Give me a headache. All they do is play Soldier Boy and some crank, I mean, whatever it is. I, I can't figure out what the word, I mean, I, one of these days I figure out what the words are. But she did, so I turned it on and they play this music by people I've never heard of. Um, and I, I look like a fool if I ask my daughter, who is this person? But between songs, they have this pattern, you know, the DJ says, oh, this and that. And I have no idea what they're talking about most of the time. But one of the DJs talks about hooking up. And to show you how disconnected you get after 20 years of marriage, I turned to my daughter and said, what are they talking about? <laughs> and my seven-year-old from the back seat starts explaining to me in a very convoluted way what hooking up is. Now, part of me is in complete shock. <laughs> that my, and the other part of me is saying, this is a great way of explaining dividend policy. <laughs> Do you see the connection? Dividends are like getting married. Stock buybacks are like hooking up. <laughs> Yeah, that's basically it. I mean, it's like, look, here's $3 billion, nice seeing you, don't know your name, go away, right? I mean, that's basically what the companies are doing. Companies are increasingly addicted to hooking up with stockholders. They don't want to, you know, they don't want this, you know, long-term relationship with you. They don't care. So, in an interview, if somebody asks you, why are companies buying back stock? Just give them the two-word answer. They're hooking up. <laughs> They, they'll be interested, oh, what are you talking about? Then you can explain to them what you're talking about. But that's the word I want to leave you with before we talk about the expanded version of dividend policy. <laughs>